Okay, we're live, okay. it seems. We are live. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to another episode of uh, Stark at Home, where we informally try to discuss uh, rather serious uh, and deep matters related to um, uh, StarkNet, Starkware, Stark Technology, general uh, ZKPs, and in this case, tokenomics. So um, I'm very, very excited to have with us uh, Professor Noam Nisan, who is a principal researcher at Starker and also a renowned professor of computer science and recently also of economics at the uh, Hebrew University. Um, I can share that I first met Noam when he taught me uh, the course on data structures. Uh, I was not fortunate enough to learn the from... Uh, Nim to Tetris, or from Nan to Tetris, uh, which is a very popular course that uh, Noam co-authored that came after my time. Um, but he's well known also for his uh, pedagogical skills. Uh, today we're going to talk about tokenomics. Um, but for those of you who came because you're interested also in things related to ZK uh, stuff, uh, I'll just point out that uh, the technique of arithmetization, which has to do with uh, basically converting problems about zero knowledge to questions about uh, low degree polynomials over finite fields, this was introduced to the field of zero knowledge by Noam and others in a beautiful uh, paper that also introduced the sum check protocol, and a bunch of other things. But I'm not sure we're gonna have time um, to talk about that. Uh, Noam, do you want to briefly introduce yourself or should I already go ahead with yeah. the question? So, hi, Ali. I'm uh, glad to be here and thank you for the introduction. I think you've said enough. So, uh, let me, uh, I think I don't need to introduce myself any further. So, let's uh, go on. So, um, you are the founder of Algorithmic Game Theory. So, I want to ask you, can you tell us, well, two origin stories? How did you get into Algorithmic Game Theory? You were doing pure math and complexity. And then I'm going to ask you how you got into blockchain, which is uh, related to economics and CS. Okay, so so as you as you said, I started with a, as a pure theoretician. That's where where I, whatever in what I got my PhD. That's what I worked on. And when the basically the internet came into our lives in the mid '90s, I uh, sort of thought that it was uh, very important. And uh, and I think that almost everybody in the world saw it, saw it was important. I mean, the newspapers were full of it. Uh, people everywhere outside of computer science knew something interesting was happening with this internet. Uh, but the computer science research in universities was sort of uh, very slow to change. And I thought that there is a lot, uh, really a lot to study and to think about, uh, about this new world of the internet. And I started to look into these things, and very soon I realized that the thing that seemed most interesting, at least to me, uh, was the question of incentives. That is, previously, before the internet, uh, we had distributed systems, we had many different kinds of uh, issues uh, about computers, but we really didn't uh, take into account the fact that one computer is owned by one person, another per computer owned by another person, and that is outside of cryptography where we always knew that people you know, could be bad or malicious, but we didn't have this notion that no one is malicious, it's just working for himself. And how to get cooperation between computers that belong to different people, none of them really malicious, or most of them not malicious, but just selfish, uh, was a very new thing that we sort of uh, needed, I think, for the internet to find, to create systems that really work on the internet. So that's what I started to get interested at. And uh, it was obvious that, uh, you know, game theorists and economists really thought about these kinds of issues about cooperation and competition and how do you get systems involving many selfish entities and I thought ah now we just need to connect that to computer science and I think I wasn't alone so there were a bunch of people starting uh, to do this kind of uh, connection and that's basically how I got into uh, this uh, field of algorithmic game theory basically trying to think what is the interesting major uh, you know, major characteristic of computer systems and the internet that we missed before in computer science. When I have something on a personal level, I mean, you know, you were a, a highly revered, uh, you know, pure math theoretical computer scientist. 
weren't you like scared to like uh, you know leave all of that and uh, meddle in this uh, much more mundane uh, I don't know economic yeah. stuff like uh, why why leave yeah. all of that amazing you know de-randomization and complexity theory um, stuff that you were doing uh, very successfully prior to that yeah Yeah, okay, so that's a nice question. So the truth is personally, I you know, I was already tenured, so you know the personal risk was low. Uh, but indeed, I mean it was a bit scary. I have to I have to say that you know people around me, all the computer scientists around me, uh, you know, they didn't look down at this new thing, but they thought, oh, this is really interesting. You should keep on looking at that. Uh, I can tell you an anecdote. My parents were sort of very uh, worried about my switch. So they understood mathematics, computer science, that seemed to them something serious uh, for a scientist to do. But economics was very fishy, especially this new kind of economics. And they were really worried that I'm sort of throwing my career away. And uh, until at a certain point in time, my father uh, met Avi Vigdorson in the parking lot next to our to their house. And he complained to Avi Vigdorson that his son, me, was sort of doing something crazy with his career. And then Avi told him, "No, no, you don't understand. This is really interesting. This is going to be a big thing. It's very good that Noam is doing it." And my father uh, was uh, sort of uh, satisfied, and from that point on, even my family wasn't too worried. <laughs> So. okay so um, I mean you know you were uh, you are and uh, you know highly successful now in the field of uh, algorithmic uh, game theory um, why uh, blockchain what's interesting okay okay so what's interesting to me so first of all I have to I have to uh, you know confess the reason I really uh, at first got into blockchains was really because you sort of uh, showed me that there was excitement. So I was looking after I was Dean of Computer Science, I was looking at different things. What should I be looking into next when I have suddenly more time as not being Dean? And I looked at various kinds of stuff, of course, you know, learning was interesting, AI and so on. Uh, but, you know, looking at various subfields, I have to admit that the most exciting subfield that I saw was the blockchain world. That was the only thing where I felt the level of excitement that I remembered from the early days of the Internet, where everybody knew something big was going on. And I thought, you know, excitement is where I want to be. And this is intellectual excitement. So, so maybe, but let me say, what do I think is really intellectually exciting in this field? And it's not, you know, the, the mechanics of the blockchain or of the decentralization or even or not the mechanics, of the, the mechanics of the economics. But I think there is a new human concept here of a new way to organize, a, I don't know, not corporations, but to organize new kind of, you know, multi-people systems in a way that manages to, to, to get this type of a long scale, large scale corporation uh, without having any trusted entity in the middle. And this is a very new thing, I believe, in like in human, uh, human history. Uh, and this may be, you know, maybe, you know, maybe nothing, everything will blow away and we'll have nothing out of the whole blockchain experience. But just maybe this kind of, I like the name Web3 more than blockchain, this kind of Web3 experience where you get uh, this type of corporation without a central entity in a completely decentralized way is sort of, uh, you know, a revolution like the limited liability corporation was a revolution a few hundred years ago. You know, people had this very strange idea a few hundred years ago. Maybe we let some people call themselves a corporation. And then if they take loans, none of the people has to return them if they fail. And somehow that was a good idea. And it seems a crazy idea even today. Uh, but we all know today that it was a very good idea, this limited liability corporation. It actually made a huge change in how we can run things as a, you know, as a society. And it may well be that here in the Web3 world, uh, we can maybe are seeing like the seeds of something similar in importance. Maybe not, but maybe we are. So, you know, I really relate to like one thing that I, you're saying uh, uh, like the first thing you mentioned is like excitement, like blockchain excitement. And I personally relate to that a lot because I recounted this story many times, including on this on this forum, that like um, the way I got involved in, in blockchains was by attending the Bitcoin conference in 2013. And the most 
memorable thing I just remember from that is the excitement around and like this uh, sort of Woodstock kind of feeling. And uh, it took me a very long time to process and articulate, uh, you know, rationally what why it was important for me to to go into it. But like this emotional thing, I think those who experienced the excitement of blockchain probably uh, know what you're talking about. I want to ask you now, can you define what is tokenomics? What is, is it a new field? Like, what, what is this about? Uh, please explain to us. Okay, so, so let me tell you how I, how I you like to use the word. So, so some people use tokenomics in a very narrow sense of, you know, how the tokens of some company or some entity are divided by different kinds of people. That's not like, like how I like to, view, to use the name. Uh, I believe I call it economics basically the whole economic analysis of this type of new entity which runs in a decentralized way and always almost certainly has its own token. And then you have like economic questions because we have this new type of entity that's running. It has you know micro questions and macro questions and governance questions and various types of issues. And since this is like a new type of entity, how do we do things in a decentralized way? And we have different new questions uh, that are similar to like economic questions for corporations or even for states. And I think these type of, you know, pseudo economic questions, but also when they uh, apply to a decentralized, uh, you know, system, if you wish, uh, with tokens, most probably, uh, that's what I like to call tokenomics in a very wide sense. Okay. Um, by the way, I want to say to the audience, uh, we, we have uh, just an unbelievable large uh, show up uh, coming to hear uh, Professor Nissan here. I see it's uh, over, th it's near 3,400 people are listening. So quite a, uh, a show up. For the first time we're using this particular uh, platform, uh, I encourage the interested uh, listeners to pose questions will from time to time, I mean, it's a very large audience, so we'll from time to time pick a few questions related to the subject matter and answer them. For those who came to ask all kinds of particulars about, um, you know, provisions or stuff like that, I, I, I regret to tell you that uh, we won't be addressing any of that matter. This is going to be about, as I said, Stark at Home is, you know, informal discussions of, um, you know, general research things related. So. Um, you know, please uh, don't uh, bombard us with those kinds of questions. But if you're curious about what uh, Professor Nissan is speaking about, then please pose questions and we'll from time to time answer them. Um, so I guess uh, maybe we'll have a discussion, first of all, you know, maybe you can, first of all, so The Starknet token, as an example, right, has three uh, different uh, use cases. Maybe you can go over them and talk a little bit about, um, you know, how they relate to more traditional things in economics and how you would think about them. And from there, later on, we'll talk a little bit about uh, micro tokenomics and then also macro tokenomics. And I'll ask you to explain what you, how you define each one of them. First of all, what are the three utilities and what the uh, Okay, so, so so let's see. So we in Stark, where we usually say, or at StarkNet, we usually say that the token has three main uh, uses. The first one is governance. The second one is paying fees. And the third one is uh, staking. So let's talk about these three uses. I think each one of them talks about uh, a significant uh, sub-area, if you wish, of, of tokenomics. So the first one is governance. How do you want, uh, how do you organize, how do you change, how do you modify, how do you govern, and govern uh, some Web3 like decentralized entity? And so that's a big question. It, it, to some extent, it's like corporate government governance in the usual world, where the question is you have a corporation, how do you govern it? You know, do you have a, you have a CEO, board of directors, uh, uh, shareholders, and so on? And there's a huge uh, literature, both from law and from finance and from economics. What is the best way to run normal, uh, normal corporation? I think the same kind of question you get uh, for this type of new decentralized uh, entities. How do you run them? And one of the most interesting questions in this, how do you run them, is you have need to start with the question, what is the, your goal? What are these decentralized entities trying to do? What should they try to do? 
So for example, for a corporation, uh, it's sort of clear that the goal of a corporation is to maximize the profits for share, shareholders. That's, you know, it took a lot of time for people to, for, you know, humanity basically, to figure out that that's a good way to run, to run corporations with actually having this very explicit goal of the purpose of the corporation. But it does not seem that that is a correct goal for a decentralized Web3 kind of entity. And it's, you know, maybe it's interesting to think a little bit, why wouldn't this be the goal uh, for a web, for a decentralized entity to maximize the profit of shareholders? And I think the main reason is, if this is your, why do people even come to a decentralized uh, system? Why don't they use a centralized system, which probably is faster and cheaper and so on? Because they really value the decentralization, they really value the fact that they are not dependent on any single body, on any single corporation, on any single government. That's what they want to do. If you take that away from them, if the decentralized system runs for its own shareholders, then you're basically losing most of the benefits that you're going to get from decentralization. So you can't, this can't be the goal of a decentralized entity. If you build the goal, if you're, let's say, a for-profit corporation, and you're building a decentralized entity with this kind of goal that just tries to maximize the benefit of the corporation, the for-profit corporations that created this decentralized entity, you're not going to get any users, you're not going to get any use, you're probably not going to give real value for society because you're not getting anything for, the, for all the troubles of decentralization. So I think the first question is what is the goal uh, of, a, of a corporation. And once you have that, then you can start asking, okay, so how are we going to run a corporation? How are we going to govern it? And that's a really interesting and difficult question. And I think there's lots to do there. It starts with normative questions. What do you want to do? Uh, you know, what is correct for humanity and so on. So I, I you know, that's a huge uh, area and I haven't thought of it about it much. I mean, we have thought about it all of us, but I think that there is no clear understanding on this question, except for one thing that I would want to say, that it seems very clear that a decentralized uh, entity like this, it really should try to uh, give value to society. If you don't give value, if you don't help your users, if you don't give your users something that they need and want, you didn't do anything. So that's the, you know, the first very clear thing. And so you definitely want somehow to maximize the value that you create. Beyond that, there is much to think about. So uh, that would be the first, uh, I suppose, the uh, question of uh, maybe not completely classic economics of how to run a go how to govern your Web three system, your decentralized entity. So that's the first uh, point. Right of the three utilities. Yes. Of the three utilities of the token, so the first one, the governance, it's a really interesting question, and I don't think that I have much to talk about it uh, here, uh, although definitely it's going to be a huge question, uh, both normative and practical. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go to the second uh, kind of question, and, and this is the question of you're using it to pay fees. So again, notice the fact that since users are paying fees to your system, it already means that the system is doing something that they want. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to pay fees for anything, right? So then the question is, okay, so how do you organize? So we have a system, and remember that we're not just trying to maximize the profit of anyone, of like some owners or some token holders or some corporations that created the, the, the system to begin with. Uh, we are trying to maximize utility in some way, and maybe other goals as well. And then the question is, okay, so how are you going to set the fees to the users not to maximize your own profits, but rather to, to do what the corporation needs to do, what the entity, Web3 entity needs to do. That is to maximize, the, let's say, the utility it brings to society as well, as, as at large, uh, sometimes called the social welfare in economics jargon uh, that the system brings. So that's the second kind of question uh, that basically you need to start thinking about uh, before you start, uh, you know, doing any you know, mechanical, mathematical questions about how do we set the fees. You need to figure out what do you need fees for. And then you start having a whole, you know, microeconomic-like theory of how do you, in a tokenized Web3 system, how do you set fees in a way that does what you want to do, okay? That gets you the goals of, you know, 
that it give it, let's say at least specifically giving more utility to to humanity to your users so that's the second kind of question and it's very similar to microeconomics but in this new setting of a web3 uh, tokenized entity system okay and definitely you know starkware with its la 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 layer 2 kind of solution is, is is an example of this something that brings value to users and you want to think okay how do you set the fees because of course you're going to have some fees in order to run the system so that's you know for at the high level that's the second kind of question uh, that's very similar to microeconomics theory so we went over governance and we went over um, uh, fee uh, paying for fees fees Thank Sorry you for what's going on here with the balloons. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, paying for fees is like, I would say the central question or the first question in like a whole microeconomic kind of analysis that you want to do with Web3 systems. And you can think of many, you know, further questions about you know, combination of different such uh, Web3 entities or networks and, and other questions like that. But that's the second type of question, a microeconomic fee-based question. And then there is a third type of question, which is somewhat similar to macroeconomics, but again, applied not to states and countries, uh, but rather to, uh, to Web3 systems. And uh, that question is, though, how do you organize this whole idea of, you know, when do you mint the token, what do you do with the token, how much people are paid uh, for participating in the operation, and all the questions of basically you have a token, it's like like normal you know, fiat currency that we sort of have this huge body of literature of how do we organize it, what is the inflation rate, what is the interest rate, how does it control various things that you care about in a normal economy. Uh, you want something analogous uh, for a Web3 system where you control the token. So it's not a whole country, it's a smaller kind of thing, but it has its own token and you do have some control of the token. And you, the, all different questions that you may ask for a country, now you can ask about how to control your own uh, token in a Web3 system. So that's the third type of question I would say that I would put into the, you know, the, the big, uh, you know, vague word of tokenomics. Okay. So, um, by the way, what about like um, things like say, staking and um, you know minting and burning? Where do those fit into the various utilities of, uh, of a token? Yeah. Okay. So I would say that minting is is, is square falls square into the macroeconomic question because you mint new tokens and sometimes you burn them. Of course, that's a macroeconomic thing. How much do you want to burn? Mint. How much do you want to burn? But, uh, and then of course staking, so minting its main purpose is going to be uh, for staking, or it could be, I'd, be, I'd like to say that a main purpose, if not the main purpose of the minting should be to reward the stakers uh, in a proof of stake system. So of course we have other proof of work systems, which I, I don't want to talk about here. Uh, but, so that would be macro tokenomics, but we have to remember that when you actually reward people, you always have to think also about the macroeconomic implications, about the incentives at the, you know, at the micro level that you're introducing. So there, are, there's a, there is a macro question of how, in general, overall, you want to see, you know, rewards and minting and burning. And there are micro questions about how, in particular, you're giving the right incentives uh, for people. Uh, so, so I would say they're mostly macro with, of course, some micro implications. Okay. As someone now that uh, has the um, no real knowledge of economics, I know there's microeconomics and there's macroeconomics, mm -hmm. and they're very, very different. And we're now going to talk very soon about micro tokenomics and Thanks. macro tokenomics. Economics. Can you please, uh, once and for all, explain at least to me, maybe to the listeners, what is the uh, micro and macro for? Well, for tokenomics, maybe by using an analogy for uh, from the world of economics, maybe we'll at least understand um, my macro distinction. Okay, yeah, so th th that's a good question. So I think that micro tokenomics, you're looking for a very specific small, I don't know, market or transaction or exchange or, you know, buy sell kind of, ish, uh, of, of situation. And you're looking only at that and you're thinking about the participants 
you know, what each one of them wants, what each one of them can do, what are the actions that they can perform, and what their incentives are. So in some sense, that's, you know, and then you're trying to see, you know, how are things evolving? What do you need to do in order to get the, you know, the optimal results, the best results? What are the types of equilibria that you will get because you are different participants? Uh, but all of them looking at a very uh, small, so you're focusing, you're trying to isolate a particular situation let's say sometimes between a few people, sometimes between more, many people, but, you know, maybe t considering one good or two goods or a small number of items, and you're trying to figure that out. And usually microeconomics can figure it out uh, very well. So, of course, you know, there's always in economics a difference between any series that you do and the real world. The real world is always more complex because people are always more complex. But you still, if you analyze it reasonably well, you get very good approximations to what happens in the world at a micro level because you're dealing with a very well-focused problem. The macro questions are different. They're talking about, you know, whole economies, whole societies, whole countries, questions like what is the total employment or inflation in a country? And that's usually uh, more difficult to analyze well mathematically. And I think it's also probably true that there's less uh, consensus on what is the correct macroeconomics than there is on what is the correct microeconomics. So the macro is difficult. It talks with gen questions that in general are very wide and so also a bit vague. And I think, believe in general, people understand less the macro questions than the micro questions. And uh, it need not be exactly the same, by the way, in tokenomics. Maybe because we are in like an artificial society, Maybe we can figure out the macro tokenomics as well as we can the microeconomics uh, tokenomics. Uh, we'll have to see. So now I'm guessing that a lot of the listeners are like myself, you know, well versed in uh, blockchain in general. They know the Bitcoin's minting schedule. They yeah. probably know something about EIP fifteen fifty nine as the fee mechanism on Ethereum. They know about gas. So can you help us um, understanding? How would you define uh, the questions that are micro tokenomics and what kind of questions are macro tokenomics? And then we'll dive into some of those. Okay, so I think my, I would say that micro tokenomics is basically from the point of view of users buying stuff from the system and, uh, and figuring out how do you want uh, your interfacing with your users usually at a very small, at a very uh, low level of granularity. So the user wants to do X, how are you going to price it in a way that you get the type of results that you want, okay? So I think the most natural, so if we're taking from the blockchain world, everything that relates to fees is very clearly a microeconomics. When, let's say, when Ethereum uh, had the, you know, EIP-1559, they designed a new fee mechanism. So where I'm putting in some money, you know, you know, the fee is defined according to some kind of schedule where the base fee goes up and then there's a tip and so on. And that's like a whole type of mechanism as it's very specific. And when I, as a user, actually go to go and want to buy to run my transaction, I basically respond to incentives along that line. Now, 1559 also has uh, another component of fee burning uh, which is basically intended really, which, you know, the user doesn't really care about. So from the user's point of view, it's the same whether you burn the fees or give them to anyone, uh, I don't know, anyone that you want, a validator, say. Uh, but from the validator's point of view, of course, it matters a lot uh, whether he gets a fee or the fee is burned and so on. So there's also a microeconomic kind of question on the validator side about in this specific transaction, what are my incentives and what happens if I get the money, someone else gets the money, you know, the fees and so on. So all these small details about looking at the specific, uh, the specific transaction and how the validator acts and how the users act and so on, uh, that's microeconomics. Now, of course, if you look at the fee burning at large, then you're suddenly in the macroeconomic thing because we burn a lot of fees overall then of course that has macroeconomic implications uh, because you know the total number of tokens uh, gets uh, decreased or increased according to how how it works and that's a macroeconomic let's say implication of the microeconomic mechanism 
Uh, so that's an example of what would be a micro kind of question. And I would say probably it's the levels that we understand now, the most concrete and, and question that we should think about is how to design fees. Uh, and that would be the classic, you know, the let's say the cornerstone or the center of your microeconomic uh, analysis in a blockchain world. Okay, so now maybe let's start diving in. And uh, I just want to remind the the, the listeners, uh, we have around already 7,000 of them, according to what this platform says. If you have questions, please feel free to put them in the comments, either on the, I don't know where you're listening, either on LinkedIn or on Twitter or directly on, on, on the apps. And basically, we'll be able to see them and then answer them. Uh, the marvels of technology, so I'm told. Uh, so please don't uh, be shy about asking questions on the subject matter. Um, so, uh, Noam, can you lead us through your thinking process or ge just generally what's yeah. going on today? Like how should one design uh, fees? What are the general okay. principles that you think uh, we should be designed by and then uh, i think we should talk a little bit about like uh, all the intricacies of getting it right okay so so let's see so i think the the most interesting and important question is what do you want to achieve so you know you're going to design fees in some way uh, you know as a, definitely as a scientist you have some kind of goal and you're going to design the fees in the way that will get you as close to possible to your goal so what is your goal supposed to be, right? So classically in mechanism design, let's say in auction design, uh, classically the people are talking about two different types of, uh, of goals. One of them is called social welfare minimization, maximization, and the other is called revenue maximization. So revenue maximization means that I'm looking from the point of view of the seller and I'm trying to maximize his profits, his revenue. Social welfare maximization means that I'm trying to look from the outside, so I don't have favor the buyer or the seller. I'm looking from the outside. Let's say I'm a benevolent, benevolent government, and I'm trying to design it in the way that will bring most uh, utility to the world. And, you know, there, there, that's classical economic theory, and both uh, of these questions are very, very well studied. And the first thing that I would like to claim is that in the blockchain, uh, in the Web3 context, let's say, really you're mostly interested in the question of social welfare maximization, what it's called, that is, in trying to give get the most utility to people using your system, taking, of course, into account the costs of people operating the system. Okay, so I think that's uh, that's the first goal, and that's you know an interesting thing to 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 ponder about. Why would this be your goal? Why you're trying to optimize welfare, which is sort of like a you know selfless, uh, I don't know, maybe goody good kind of a goal, and why is that the right thing to to optimize? And I would claim that uh, it is the right thing to optimize because, again, if you're not trying to work for your users for trying to social welfare, the whole point of decentralization from the point of view of the users is sort of lost. They don't need another entity that's sort of decentralized in its operation but acts like it's centralized. That's just not going to do it, right? And the same thing is going to be reflected in the long term in the governance and so on. So, uh, first of all, I would claim that the most... Uh, important thing that people should you know agree to or not agree to is the fact that really we should design the system in the way that brings most utility to society now once you have that then you know now you know classical economic theory classical mechanism design uh, sort of lets you try to do that and uh, and uh, there are two levels to do that so i think the first uh, principle is a, a very classical economics 101 type of principle that's the way to make sure that we get the optimal social welfare from a system is to price everything at its underlying marginal cost. That is, if your transaction uh, runs on my system, now it's not my system, it's like a decentralized system, but if your transaction runs on my system and costs my system three extra cents of cost, then I should really try to price your transaction at three cents, three cents. Not more than that, not less than that. Now, the point of view of this kind of pricing is that I don't know how much your transaction is worth to you. It may be worth to you less than three cents. 
And if it's worth to you less than three cents, because the real costs associated with it, on top of everything else that's going on, are three cents, if you run it, actually the world loses. But if your utility, if your own private value from running this transaction is more than three cents, the world gains by uh, you running the system, by, by you running your transaction. So this basically means that if I manage to price the transaction, it's an exact marginal cost. So marginal cost means I'm not looking at the whole cost of the whole system. I'm looking at the cost of the system with your transaction minus the cost of running the system without your transaction. Only this gap is called the marginal cost. So if I set the fees at marginal cost, I basically automatically get a optimization. You're going to run a transaction if and only if it's good for society to run this transaction. And I managed to get this without even, uh, you know, knowing, in, get, you know, getting inside your head and understanding and trying to really extracting from there what is the real value that you get from your transaction. It's enough to set the fees correctly and we get this kind of thing. But so, who can cover now the fixed cost, right? I mean... Um, uh, in the context that you're yeah. starting it, right? There's a uh, you know this big group that uh, comes along, and now if I add, I think you once gave me the analogy of like you know there's a bus going from whatever uh, A to B, and it's already going there. And now I marginal cost means that if I yeah. join the bus, I should only be paying something related to my weight and the air conditioning I'm right. breathing and things like that. But but then. Maybe you could explain that and like yeah. who pays the cost. Yeah, so actually that's a very good question. So so I, I prefer now talk giving the, the example of a book. So suppose you write a book. You know, the first copy costs, let's say, one thousand dollars for your effort in writing the book, and then one dollar extra for actually uh, printing the book. Now the next copy, every additional copy costs just one dollar. So if we say, let's say, have run another 500 copies, the total cost will be $1,500. Now, the marginal cost kind of uh, calculation, kind of principle says that the fees should be set to $1. Okay, so if I set the book at $1, I really make sure that once the book is written, I really make sure that as long as someone gets a gain that's more than $1 from reading the book, which is more than the cost to actually produce the extra copy, he gets it. So that's the correct thing if we actually, you know, once we already printed the book, once we already wrote the book, that's the correct way to price things. And of course, that really begs the question, so who's going to pay for your effort of $1,000 of writing the book? So that's a huge problem. And in the real world, uh, there's no solution except somehow the users are going to have to split that thing unless you know the government intervenes and does this original subsidy sometimes that happens but in general you're going to have to split this fixed cost what is called the first cost that they're writing the book uh, you're going to have to split it amongst these users which will cause some kind of inefficiency okay so and in the real world there is nothing to do about it the nice thing is that in our world, in the blockchain world, uh, we're going to have an escape. There is a way to pay for that for minting, uh, but maybe we'll talk about that in a little bit when we go to the macroeconomic question, uh, because even if you, man if you believe me that somehow magically we're going to find a way to pay for all these, uh, you know, the fixed costs, which the marginal costs don't pay, uh, there is always a question of... Uh, how do you uh, actually set the mechanisms to get the correct fees, to get this marginal cost? Okay, so that's important. And there is a very tricky uh, issue there of what exactly is counted in the marginal cost. Uh, because the most important, usually in the blockchain setting, for example, the most important element of the marginal cost is actually uh, what's, cost, uh, what's called the uh, congestion cost. Because your transaction got in, somebody else's transaction did not get in. That happens whenever we have some kind of, let's say, limitation, bottleneck for the system. Uh, for example, let's say in Ethereum, you can't run more than, I don't know, 13 transactions a second on the average or a certain amount of gas. And uh, if your transaction got in, somebody's didn't get in and you caused him harm. That's definitely part of the marginal cost of your transaction, and sometimes called the congestion cost, and we need to make sure you pay for it. Okay, so uh, 
so even if we figure out what you want, what we want to pay, so we want you to pay the marginal cost, that marginal cost can contain, includes congestion costs, there is still the technical issue of how do you price things, how do you set things so that really people pay that, okay? I want to, so, yeah, sorry. I, I just want to, there's a question from the audience that I want us to address. Mm -hmm. And uh, sorry, but you were, um, yeah, maybe you finish what you wanted to say and then we'll take the okay. question. No, actually, maybe let, let me leave this question as is and then I'll get into it because I'm trying to, because that okay. talks about the whole subfield of economics that we're going to use to, to address that question. But uh, let's uh, see where you... Uh, okay, so it's a good yeah, place to start. Yes, Ehrenberg. Yeah. Yeah, so what happens when I pay transaction fees on, uh, in STRK on StarkNet? Some of it is used to pay for Ethereum settlement, some of it's around the StarkNet infra, some of it is burned. Burned. I see. So, okay, so now we're talking specifically in our system today. So, in general, it is true that, uh, you know, currently you can pay in StarkNet both in Ethereum directly and in, in Starks. Now, of course, the expenses of uh, running the system are always going to be partially in it today, let's say, as long today we still have a centralized operation. So our decentralization process has only started and the sequencing and proving is still done in a centralized way by the company Starkware. Okay, so today the expenses of Starkware as a company for running your transaction includes paying ETH to Ethereum because we are a layer two running on over L1, so we need to pay them. And uh, basically, the marginal cost there is your data availability costs, which are now with blobs very, very low. And the fixed costs are basically the compute costs, basically setting up a whole proof, uh, which is a sort of expensive thing, but it's not marginal because many, many transactions can share. it. And the second cost is, of course, just the dollar cost of buying stuff, you know, cloud services from Amazon. So definitely when today, when you pay fees in Stark, and also when we have to sell the Stark and buy East. And of course, when you want to buy Stark to run your transaction, you have to buy Stark uh, selling, I don't know, dollar or ETH or whatever type of, it, of uh, you know, currency you have. So that's basically what happens. And today there is no burning and there is no minting. So we're not doing neither burning nor minting until everything, until operation of the system is decentralized, at least in the sense of that permissionless, that anyone can become an operator and get a part of the minting or burning, whatever happens. So currently today there is no burning and no minting. Okay, so back, uh, we, we answered this question. Thank you, Juan, for it. Um, you were about, I think, to explain or touch upon, um, I guess, well, one thing that makes me yeah. curious and is related to it is like, yeah, what is, I mean, setting prices is a very old uh, subject. Mm -hmm. And um, what makes it uh, more challenging or different in the context of uh, blockchain? And then how do you, what are the dimensions and uh, yeah. market designs currently out there for dealing with it? Yeah. Okay. So, so the nice thing about you know once you know what you got to do, what what you want to do in the set of fees, how do you do that? The nice thing is that there is a you know very developed sub area of economics called mechanism design, and actually that's also the sub area of algorithmic game theory is called algorithmic mechanism design. And there's enormous amount of work of how to design you know auctions and markets and uh, and online transactions in a way that gets the right incentives and manage to get you the kind of uh, you know what you want basically in terms of fees. And uh, so, so there's a huge literature there. Basically, you know, the most important result probably in that literature or the beginning, the first result in that literature is a so-called Vickrey second price auction, which uh, sort of uh, figured out a very interesting idea that if you set your fee to be in a second pricing, that is the highest bidder wins and pays the low bidder. And in the case, in the context of, uh, you know, multiple uh, items, which is basically the blockchain context. It means that what you're going to pay is basically uh, what is needed to kick out the guy that was kicked out because of your transaction. And uh, the major discovery of Vickery in the 1960s was that that gives you a, what's called incentive compatibility. That is, the rational players will logically bid truthfully and the system will, will 
because of that, reach the, you know, the basically the, the outcomes that you wanted to get to begin with. So that's a very, you know, developed uh, area of economics, game theory, algorithmic game theory, and we can apply that also to the blockchain world. And now, of course, when you apply an existing theory to a new situation, you always need to do new stuff. And there are lots of differences in uh, the context that we have in, uh, in the blockchain world. There are lots of differences from the classical things that were studied in, uh, in algorithmic mechanism design. Uh, for example, it's a two-sided thing. We need to worry about because we're in a decentralized setting, there is no auctioneer that you trust by itself because now the auctioneer is sort of going to be decentralized, distributed between many different validators or something like that. You have to design the, the you know, your auction or your market in a way that works, that has the correct incentives in both ways. That's a new challenge. Uh, other types of challenges, you want everything that you depend upon that the auction depends about to be on-chain rather than off-chain. Uh, another, uh, so, so there are some limitations that make questions more difficult. On the other hand, there are also some situations that make things uh, easier for us in the blockchain context. Uh, for example, you know, this mempool is some kind of significant information that different parties can also have access to in some sense, maybe not 100% sense, but in a way that may be getting the correct statistics. So wallets that can sit on the mempool and use that to do your bidding for you. So that makes it a little bit easier than the classical uh, mechanism design literature. And also we have a sequence of auctions and you can learn and you can actually optimize uh, from using the previous in history that also is a, sometimes a somewhat easier things to do, but it has its own complications. So basically I would say that at this point uh, we understand enough about this whole uh, field of algorithmic mechanism design to actually be able to just tackle the differences between the classical situation and this new situation and design reasonably good uh, mechanisms that we sort of understand their pros and their cons and what you gain and what you lose and how exact it is and how not exact it is. Uh, so in that situation, I feel that, uh, you know, this is now... Uh, a sub area of uh, you know how to design fees is something that uh, you know scientists can use existing literature and say clever clever enough things you know of course it's still a work in progress and still really lots of interesting things going on uh, but that's the situation so uh, now, uh, preparing to this you you told me that today if you're you know you want to pick your transaction fee mechanism, there are like three very fundamental ways. There's like first price, first price, 1559, and uniform price. Can you, you know, give us the economist, like your economist view on what are these three three different mechanism mechanisms for fees and their pros and cons? Um, it's interesting that there's not just one that everyone is using. Okay. So 1559 and uniform price, what are they? Okay, so so let's uh, let's start. So first of all, let's we're you know, this is a question about the simple kind of fee mechanism design where we have like a single dimensional, sometimes it's called. We have like one good, like gas in Ethereum or like block space in, in Bitcoin. And so I suppose that the three basic kind of mechanisms you can think about are the following. What first one is what Bitcoin has, which is the first price auction. Everybody offers the price and, the, uh, and you know, and the, 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 the basically the miner takes whatever transaction they, they want, and they will take basically the transaction that, that offer him the most uh, money. And the way to do this optimization is basically uh, according to bank for buck. That is, I'm looking at the size of your transaction, I'm looking at how much money you're offering, and I'm looking at the price per, per size or price per gas and taking it greedily more or less. Even though, you know, real estate market, right? You sell a house, uh, people show up and uh, you just go with the one that gives the highest. Uh... Uh, yes, but now, you know, it's a real estate market that where people want to buy only parts of your house. So you want to, you go according to how much they're willing to pay per square meter or square foot of your house, right? Okay. And, and theoretically, you know, this may be viewed as a knapsack problem, which is NP hard. But practically, the so what so-called greedy approximation, uh, which is you go by the linear solution, uh, which is doing exactly this kind of greedy thing of bank per 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 buck, uh, is exactly uh, is a very good approximation. You know, within some, uh, you know. Some okay, so this was the first. 
and it's well known and it's very simple. What's not to like about it? Why right. Why did the people come up with any other mechanism right. but with this very simple one? Right. Okay. So, so what's not to like about it? The main thing is not to like about it is what's called it's not incentive compatible or the way we like to view it in the blockchain world as this is like a UX from the user. So if I need to define, to, if I need to offer a bid uh, for my block, let's say in a first price auction, I don't really know how much to bid. So suppose I probably do know how much gain, how much I will be willing to pay for my block, my transaction to be a part of the block. Let's say I know I'm willing to pay $4 because that's the, you know, the gains that I get from it. But I don't really want to pay $4. If it can get in with $1, I'd rather pay $1. And in the first price auction, if I say four dollars, the four dollars will be taken from me if uh, if that uh, you know if if, if that my my transaction get accepted. Uh, so I will probably try to say instead of four three or two or one, and I don't know what to say whether three or two or one because it depends on the whole world. So that's it makes it very difficult to participate in these kind of auctions. And in general, people don't like. Uh, that kind of uh, situation because it's difficult for the users. They need to keep on changing their bid according to the market situations. Now, so that's a minus, but I would like to say there are two things that uh, make it not so bad. So the first one is like a general kind of thing. In a situation where the market is sort of stable, I can sort of try to figure out, I look at the market and I can sort of analyze the market correctly and figure out what is the best uh, bid that I can make with the IE, what is the lowest bid that will get me in? So in a situation of equilibrium, if it's the market is not too, uh, you know, uh, wavy, it's not, uh, it doesn't change too, too quickly, I sort of do know what to, to bid. And moreover, you can actually do this calculation about what happens in equilibrium and people will bid this minimum price that would get me in at equilibrium will be exactly this marginal cost that we talked about. Very okay? interesting. So that's one interesting thing. Now, in the blockchain world, I would say there's another thing saying that it's not so bad, the first price auction. And that is because the mempool is sort of, uh, you know, it's sort of uh, public. People can access it. And the mempool is really the statistics of all my uh, competition. And looking at that, I can sort of figure out, and I don't, don't need to be the user itself, but let's say the wallets through which is bidding, making its uh, bids. I can figure out what is the best transaction. And indeed, you know, your wallets have a pretty good idea of what to bid in order to get you into, to, into Bitcoin, right? So there's another reason why in the blockchain world, it's even less bad than usual. But still, it's, you know, it's not perfect. It's, it's problematic to do this kind of bidding. And so people want a different kind of... Uh, right, which brings us to the two competing alternatives, right? Right. Uh, which one do you want to explain first? Okay, so I first want to explain the actually the competing alternative, which is both theoretically understood, I suppose, and uh, well understood and used in Ethereum, which is sort of, uh, you know, a fixed price. So why am I calling Ethereum a fixed price? If I'm looking at a certain block, the price that I'm going to change for the, the that is going to be charged for my transaction is basically determined by the history, by previous blocks, and it's fixed. That is going to be a fixed base price per gas. I'm ignoring here uh, the tiny thing of the tip, which is not like the first approximation because the tip is sort of like a first price mechanism that was you know, added to the Ethereum thing. But the basic point of Ethereum, which is both the majority of the money when we're talking about the majority of the bid and also the overaching uh, rationale for this kind of uh, uh, this kind of mechanism is that the, there's a, the price for gas is fixed for the block. And so that's basically... A grocery store and seeing, you know, that the, an apple is one dollar and then either I pick it or I don't. Exactly. It's exactly like going to the grocery store. And so I know exactly I, I can bid a very, I just say I'm willing to pay at most $10 for an apple. I go to the store. I can send someone to the store. And if the store is less than $10, let's say the, the apple costs only $1, I will only pay one. And that's very good for the user because, you, you know, we can send someone to do your bidding with you. You know exactly. You don't need to worry about. You bid the maximum that you're willing to pay according to how much you really like apples. And, and you get it. And you always pay the best price, the, the, the price that was set outside. Now, in a store, the store owner usually determines the price of the apple. 
So we're actually in a blockchain situation in 1559. We're in a situation where if you wish the government, someone else, according to history, determines the price of the apple. So it's even the store owner or let's say the validator of the block can't decide to sell what the price is. So it makes it even easier for the validator because the validator just has a fixed price that was told to him. So we have also this easy you know, incentive compatibility for the validator. Okay, so that's again ignoring uh, the you know the tip kind of thing, which basically needs to be put inside uh, because uh, of the maximum, the hard limit on the block size. Because if we didn't have any hard limit on block size, then you know the validator would just take everyone who's willing to pay the current price, and everything would be fine. Uh, now you know in reality we don't want blocks to to grow infinitely. So there are two things going on. First of them, generally speaking, the, the mechanism, the way that sets the fixed prices according to history is done in a way that makes sure that the average block size is 15 mega, uh, mega gas, right? So there's a very simple thing. If there's too much demand, the price goes up. So too, too little demand, the price goes down. And that's a very simple mechanism that stabilizes that's the correct average thing. And on top of that, you also have a hard limit of 30 mega. You know, that's the way it works. And to actually make sure things work with that, you need to put on this first price kind of addition of the tip mechanism. But let's not go get into that uh, more delicately. So that's the second mechanism. And it's very, it's very nice and very elegant, very easy. To Why not? Uh, yeah. What's not to like about it? Why okay. a third or like, uh, okay, what's the problem? Right, yeah. So what's not to like about it? So there are a bunch of things not to like about it. Uh, here are two things that I think not to like about it. The first thing is the fact that because the validators don't get most of the bids, uh, their incentives uh, uh, to actually be, act as, 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 as specified are not that strong. So suppose uh, that I, as a validator, don't take your bid. If you bid $100 and the base price is only $1, I'm only losing $1 from not taking your bid. And sometimes that's not good. Sometimes I really want to make sure that uh, I really want to make sure that you that the validator loses $100 from not taking the bid because otherwise he's not paying for any decisions that he's making against the protocol. He's only paying a very small thing about his tip. So that's the first thing that you're uh, there is this problem here that the validator incentive to deviate from the protocol uh, are not as strong as you would want them to be. Right. So that Which is related to this uh, minor extractable value and the fact that there are other incentive mechanisms that override and uh, somehow corrupt the uh, action of uh, miners. Uh, absolutely. So the first thing is I think that it's probably fair to say that uh, this kind of mechanisms where the miners, where the, you know, the validators lose only a little bit from not acting according to the way they, they should, really opens the, the way uh, for MEV, because now you're losing much less for doing your, the MEV that's being paid for. So you get probably much more MEV that you would get if had you not used the, you know, the 1559 mechanism. So that's one kind of thing. By the way, another kind of uh, question is because, you know, you can look from the, from the MEV point of view, uh, today, it's probably possible to buy a block on Ethereum, basically make sure that no transaction gets in. It costs you about $100, as far as I, under, I hear from people, right? So we have this kind of weird mechanism where normally a block is a thousands of dollars worth of transactions, but for $100, you can basically buy the validator and tell him, don't put anything on this block. Now, why would you want to do that? There may be various uh, reasons to do that, but the fact that you can do it is a problem. So that's one problem. The second issue, I think, is uh, that the burning kind of thing. In order to make the you know the incentives for the validator correct, uh, you basically need to burn most of the base fee, and because otherwise, uh, because otherwise, you know, it's not going to it's not going to work correctly. But now once you now we're have back in the situation where you have like a macroeconomic implications of burning fees, and these are combined with the microeconomic considerations of designing the fee correctly. So that may be good and may be bad. In general, I don't like a, you know a side effect of a macro a macro side effect uh, uh, 
that you know maybe that's not what we wanted. If we wanted to burn some money according to some kind of reasons for macroeconomic reason, we should do it directly, not as a side effect of your you know transaction fee. So, so these are two uh, you know possible downsides of this kind of situation. Um, you know how big they are and how you know what how do you compare that to first price? That's an interesting question. Now there's a third mechanism that I that has been suggested by a bunch of people, and I think it's very easy, very interesting, and that is not have the government, you know, the history define the price of the gas price, but let the block owner decide on a gas price, and let everyone in the block pay the same gas price, not their tip. So, so that's another interesting kind of thing. It's this sort of like, you know, bonds are sold in the, in the world today. You know, there's an auction, but at the end, everybody, everybody pays the same price. And that price is the point that gives you uh, basically supply equal demand. So, so there's lots to talk about that. One nice thing is about it, you don't need to burn any money. It's not really incentive compatible, but if you try to see how not incentive compatible it is, it's very close to incentive compatible. So one can argue that practically speaking, a user, a single user will not affect the price that has been taken from a whole block. And so there is no real strong motivation uh, for any user to start optimizing because unless he is exactly this last person that got in and there's a huge gap between him and the one before him, which is the very unlikely. Okay, so, so that's on this. What's not to like about this one? Like, let's do that. Okay. Yeah, so that the, 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 uh, this new mechanism is better. Right. Is so again, yeah, so this mechanism has some other problems, uh, unfortunately. Uh, one of them is this uh, kind of monopolist problem that it's not clear that the uh, uh, validator, that the guy who describes, sets a block and decides on the, on the price, will choose the price that makes you know demand equal supply that really gives you the fee that you wanted, which is a marginal cost. But there is some motivation for him to actually uh, increase prices. What's called do use a monopolist price, which gives you suboptimal welfare. So that's one problem. Another problem is this does open possibilities for collusion between the validator and the user. Basically. Uh, uh, out of out of you know out of band, uh, they have to do some kind of deal which uh, actually lets them pay less than what uh, basically there is a rebate from the validator to users, and that can be basically corrupted that way too. So again, how bad these two things are, uh, and uh, to what extent this is practical, that's another kind of question. But that would be like a third basic type of possibility uh, that people have been looking at. Now, before and, we, yeah, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, before we get into the macro, I think that our time is uh, is running out yeah, so faster I'm than if expected. You should, uh, jump to macro, or if uh, you should talk a little bit about what is multi-dimensional. Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, let me just say. So as usual, let, let me just talk about why I won't talk about it, right? So, uh, so the the next question is. All of that was talking about one resource. And when we have more than one resource, for example, now in Ethereum, when we have these blobs, uh, you're really paying for two very different resources, blobs that currently are under demanded, so their price is still very close to zero, and normal gas. So how to make mechanisms when you have more than uh, one resource to price? That's a really more interesting question. And you know, 1559 has one solution for it, basically doing each one of them in its own separate 1559 kind of market. And there are other possibilities as well. And that's a really interesting uh, question that I do not think has been uh, is understood enough yet. So I believe that there is much more to study about how would you organize uh, these kind of multidimensional uh, fee markets? Uh, what are the costs and benefits and pluses and minuses of every possible solution? There is more work to do there, but uh, I suppose uh, that's as much time as we'll have for okay. this. So before we touch a little bit on macro uh, tokenomics mm -hmm. and like minting and burning and stuff mm -hmm. like that and staking, there's one question from Alex that I hope you can address. So Alex is asking, why would a user choose to pay using STRK instead of ETH when the cost is approximately equivalent? Equivalent. 
So the, the, if the cost is equivalent, both, uh, both things are uh, equivalent, right? So if he happens to have East, he will pay in East. If he allows it to have Stark, he will pay in Stark. But I would like to say that in the long term, we are going to move to a situation where you can only pay in Stark, and then you'll have to buy Starks. Now, you know, the, the fee to transfer from East to Stark is very, very low currently. And so that shouldn't be like a big deal. And maybe your wallets can do it for you if you really don't uh, want to... to to annoy yourself with it. Uh, but in general, it should be the same. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, our system would only work in Stark. And maybe yeah. in the middle, by the way, uh, we can also, uh, you know, give a slight, uh, you know, uh, a slight uh, discount if you pay in Starks rather than East. So I, I want to actually refer to this question from, a, not so much from a, an economic point of view, but from, from a more, um, how should I say, social point of view. Um, so when we want, decided that we want um, fees to be paid in STRK, it had some reasoning behind it. And the reasoning was something like this. Um, you know, there's, a, there's some division of, of STRK, which also means division of the power to stake, to operate the network, to govern it, and so on. And whatever it is at the start, we want there to be upwards mobility. We want there to be inclusivity. We want newcomers who are offering value to the system to have more say on its evolution, on its governance, and more ability to operate and secure it. Now, how do you make that happen? So, well, everything is governed by and operated by a proof of stake in the STRK token. So how do you give, like, you know, some, some new team that is doing great work and offering value, how do you give them a say? Well, one thing is you could have a committee of humans saying, okay, we will hand over, you know, STRK to this uh, system. And that's something that the Starknet Foundation has been doing. But you would like things that are more automated and don't involve human discretion. And one way to do it is through things like Devonomics and other programs that basically will take portions of the fees that are being paid and put them in the hands of developers and their teams that are offering value to users. And in this way, you can sort of have this, you know, upward mobility, more inclusivity, allow a seat at the table for operating and securing and maintaining um, StarkNet as an ecosystem to those who are adding value to it. Anyway, so that was some, like, just some generic thought process that went behind the requirement that STRK should be the token in which things are paid. Um, Noam, do you want to address that or should we go to token on uh, Maybe hey, let's, yeah, let, let, maybe let's go to macro because we're almost there. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. So okay. last uh, yeah. Macro to economic staking and minting. Okay. What is the basic how do you how would you know as an economist, how do yeah. you suggest we think about it? How much okay. to mint, how much to burn? So I would like to 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 start with where, you know, with something with the point that I sort of left hanging previously, who is going to pay for the fixed cost? Right. If we really are taking from the users only the marginal cost, which gives like most social welfare the best, you know, the maximum utility that our system can bring to the world, who is going to pay for the fixed costs? And the fixed costs are not neglig are not are non negligible at all. In particular, probably the largest fixed cost that any such Web3 system needs to have is all the stakers putting money, you know, in order to run to operate the system. And we need them to put in to actually stake some money, stake real money in order to operate the system is so we can know that they're operating the system correctly. We can, let's say, slash them if they don't do that. And we know, and, this, and we have some kind of civil resistance because people are putting, uh, different people probably are going to put the money and they're going to have something at stake. So if they don't operate the system well, the system crashes, they learn money, they lose money. So, which means that uh, we get some kind of economic security from the fact that they put money in the token of the system that they're helping operate, right? So, so just putting all this money to operate your system it has some cost because otherwise they could just go and buy some kind of stock and get dividends or or whatever in the financial market, right? So that's a real big cost that you have to have all set up before you, anyone starts using your system. And that's a fixed cost, not a marginal cost. And by the way, there are other fixed costs, for example, in, in our systems, like in general, in L2 zero-knowledge systems, ZK systems, uh, the proof, there is going to be a significant proof which has significant cost. And that proof, the nice thing about it 
is the fact that it's very succinct relative to the total number of transactions, which means that an expert transaction hardly changes the price that you're paying for the proof that you're putting onto L1, but uh, the fixed price of the first proof is significant. So these are all the fixed costs that you're going to pay, have to pay some somewhere. And that just raises the question that I said, in the real world, there is nothing to do. Users are going to have to pay these fixed costs. Now, the nice thing, basically, of having your own token is that you can uh, basically uh, use this token to actually pay these fixed costs. That is, you can mint new tokens, give it to the operators to pay for the fixed costs. Uh, and that basically we give, you know, takes back your system to you know, the socially optimal kind of situation, keeps user fees low because they're only paying for their marginal costs rather than for all the fixed costs. And this, if this may sound like a, you know, a mystery or a miracle to you, of course, it's not a miracle. Minting new tokens somehow uh, causes inflation in your token, basically. So it may reduce a little bit the value for the token holders. So you need to worry about this kind of inflation. If you do it too much, you're basically uh, reducing the value of your tokens. No one is going to want them. And then the whole thing stops operating, right? So the trick is, uh, can you, in both situations, can you try to have both things? First of all, mint enough tokens to pay for all the uh, fixed costs of running the system while having the inflation in check so that people will still want to keep your token and use your token to, in order to operate the system. So that's an interesting uh, question. And uh, before we talk about this, these numbers and see that it does work out, in fact, uh, I would like to say that uh, you know some uh, I don't know, listeners might be wondering whether this is even like a fair thing to do. Why are we letting the token holders pay for some of the costs that really users pay in the normal world? Okay, so beyond the fact that maybe it brings you more efficiency and keeps fees low, why is it correct to put this burden on the token holders to put making the users pay low fees? This is in the long term. And the answer is, uh, this is also in the long term in the best benefit, in the best interest of the token holders. Because if more people, if the fees are low, more people will use the system. If your system brings you more value to society, more people will use it, which will indirectly cause, you know, everything to grow, including the value of your token. So from the point of view of the token holders, this is really an investment in the platform, this inflation, this the fact that their token now has slightly less value. It's really an investment in the platform rather than an expense. And this investment makes sure that the platform works at full efficiency, full social welfare. And that's why, you know, in principle, it does make sense also for the token holders to pay for fixed costs. Now, uh, back to the facts, you know, so this works uh, sort of interestingly, you know, abstractly, but uh, can we make sure that it really, you keep very low inflation? So, uh, you know, you can try to play with the numbers and uh, we have made a proposal for Starkware, for Starknet, basically, showing how everything does work together. So we have some kind of curve, which basically mints more tokens as more stake is put into the system in a formula that's very similar to the Ethereum formula that goes up by a square root factor, basically, of the total stake. And the way that, and, and, you know, we have a blog post, so, so listeners can actually look at the detail of it. And that kind of system basically keeps your a total inflation, a yearly inflation, somewhere in the range of between, I don't know, 1% and 4%, according to the amount of staking. And that gives you significant staking and pays to the stakers something between 4% to, I don't know, maybe more than 10% as, uh, as uh, for, for actually operating the system. And it's, it's self uh, basically regulating in the sense that if you pay too much to stakers, more stakers will come in and the yield of each staker will go down until you get this kind of equilibrium where you have sufficient staking amount and uh, basically you pay the correct amount for stakers, basically competitive fees relative to the financial environment. And if the financial environment changes because maybe, I don't know, interest rates outside are going up or down, you're basically uh, just changing the amount of people that the staking and you're keeping being exactly competitive, not paying too much or too little. And all that happens with completely reasonable 
uh, number amounts of uh, inflation. It's the most extreme extreme case. If 100% of the people stake their money, which is not what we want, it's going to be only 4% inflation. And if less people stake, maybe 50% or 25%, then it's going to be significantly less. For example, a 25% staking, it's only going to be 2% inflation. So we believe that these numbers make a lot of sense in the you know, global scheme of things, could even comparing to other, to, you know, to other fiat currencies. And they completely answer the, what is needed, and that is to basically cover the fixed cost associated with the system. And the details, again, people can look at our blog post and try to look at the formula itself and the graphs and see why it indeed does work. Okay. Um, just before we go to the very last question, um, I just want to read a comment from Vic. I guess it's Victor, but I'm guessing. Um, it says, that's like how U.S. Yeah, United States issue dollars. People stake gold to get USD and legal tender and taxes collected in USD. The fixed cost of running law enforcement and defense. Um, I don't know if you want to relate to that. Or uh... I think that's uh, probably not a bad, uh, not not, mm -hmm. a, not at all a bad analogy. Yes, I, I sort of agree with it. Okay, so um, we're yeah, we're, thank you, we're yeah we're um, a bit over time, but I see there's still quite you know there are over ten thousand listeners. So uh, the, just your parting thoughts on. You know, oh, I should say, maybe, maybe I should have said this up front, but let me just say, everything we discuss here is not investment advice on anything. So having said that, what do you think, you think blockchains are here to stay? And uh, do you think uh, tokenomics research is going to be a discipline uh, in academics uh, on its own? Like, what are your predictions about blockchains and about uh, tokenomics research? Okay, so let me start about blockchain. That's going to be an easy question because I don't have prediction. I don't know. I think the most exciting thing about this field is that anything can happen. So I would not be surprised if in 10 years this whole blockchain Web3 thing completely fizzled out and no one touches it, but maybe it will be revived in 30 years again, right? Because the basic idea can go on maybe in a different way with different technologies. So that would not surprise me. Nor would I be surprised if in 10 years, half of the world is run using blockchains and and, and the Web3 kind of systems and all your social networks and all your finances and everything is done in these, these types of systems. So I think both of these you know, future pictures of the world make complete sense to me. And I really don't know, what, you know which one of them will happen. So I would like to say uh, you know, one comment, though, that uh, this is really a, a very dangerous social technology blockchain. So, you know, technology itself is not dangerous. It's not going to explode in our faces, but its social effects may be dangerous in the sense that, you know, states, as much as we don't like government, as much as we don't like corporations sometimes, you know, they serve useful purposes. And without the government, things can be terrible, terror and crime and who knows what. And the real question about our field is, are we going to be smart enough to actually create Web3 systems, create what blockchain that gives you the benefits of not trusting a centralized governor, whether it's a company or, or a government, without getting the risks that, they, that happen when there is no government, go, no government and people go completely wild uh, illegally. And that's a really interesting question with how smart we, we can be, whether we can avoid the pitfalls of, you know, weakening central government or central corporations while reaping the benefits. I believe that it is possible, but it's a danger that we should always keep thinking about. Okay, so that's, a, you know, one thing. And of course, the, that if we don't manage to do that, people will kill the whole field and justifiably so. If we do manage to do that, and I think that we can do that, I think there could be a great uh, future also for the Web3 endeavor. So that's about the, the thing, and it was easy because I don't know what will happen, so it's easy to say that. Uh, regarding tokenomics, I look at it as a researcher, and I think that it's a very marvelous new field of research. So as just like you have this huge field of research about 
economics, macro and micro and co corporate governance and how to run a corporate internally and the connections between gov corporations and so on. Huge amount of literature and all of, many of it in very interesting. I think we're just in the first steps of creating this kind of these types of, uh, you know, of series and understanding and practical uh, applications of series uh, in the blockchain world. And many of the questions there, I don't know how to formulate yet. And that's really an interesting thing always in research, formulating the correct questions is really the most interesting part. Uh, but I think that there are lots and lots to do there. Microeconomics, it's more concrete challenges. Macroeconomics, it's more less concrete challenges because we need to understand now this new world, what what is a token? What does it mean? And so on. And at government level, at the governance level of blockchain, it's even higher level kind of questions, touching maybe legal aspects and so on. And all of that is like the economic aspect and around it is the psychology and sociology of the people using blockchains, which we really haven't even started touching. But of course, once we have good rational understanding of our systems, then we start at, we will start having to take into account the lack of rationality of people using it, which is yet again another a whole new field of endeavor. So I think there's lots and lots of work to be done there academically and of course also in applied sense and I'm really looking forward to that. So um, I want to share some parting uh, statements. First of all, well, I, I I don't know anything about like uh, where the field of tokenomics will go. I do hope that it flourishes and uh, I'm sure that if we have such influential economists as you, Noam, and others like, you know, Tim Rothgarden and uh, others that are leading the charge i think we're in uh, we're in good hands um not sure we are considered more... economists but okay <laughs> yeah well mm -hmm. you know unaligned economists right yeah. i guess you know the the, the nobel laureates of uh, 20 years forward are probably not considered uh, today uh, you know part of the established field yeah, there are, there are all these famous sayings, right? You know, uh, mm -hmm. science progresses one coffin at a time, and uh, you know, setting up right. new discipline <laughs> uh, takes time to appreciate. Anyways, um, on the topic of blockchains, I of course don't have any predictions whether they will exist, but I do strongly hope that they will because I cannot imagine a free digital society in which people truly own, you know, their digital um, assets. Uh, without things like uh, blockchains, without like a public, uh, decentralized, permissionless uh, uh, integrity web uh, for them to use, right? The, the current status where all of our digital property is not really ours. It is uh, entrusted with uh, very large uh, bodies who profit from it immensely, but also control it. I think it's a much worse a solution in steady state than what blockchains have to offer. So I hope it stays around and flourishes. And I hope that in 10 years it doesn't disappear, but rather 50% or more of the world that goes with it. Um, the last thing I just want to say is that it's, uh, you know, just to the listeners, I just want to say that it's uh, a great pleasure and honor to have Professor Naomi San with us. Uh, at Starkware and uh, leading the charge on tokenomics and the economic thinking uh, behind, uh, uh, you know, micro and macro tokenomics. It gives us a lot of confidence and, uh, you know, we're surely going to make a lot of mistakes and errors, but like, uh, yeah, there's no one better to help us think through some of these very thorny um, questions in this uncharted territory than the norm. And for those of you considering joining uh, the ecosystem and, uh, you know, contributing to it, then, then one of the really nice uh, aspects is that you will uh, get uh, to meet in various forums, Noam and others like him, and, uh, you know, question him or suggest things about uh, the future of uh, the Starknet tokenomics. Noam, any parting uh, words or thoughts? No, that's about it. Well, thank you so much for the last words as well. And uh, thank all our listeners that we cannot see, but they understand we have a lot. <laughs>